Hello, everyone. Today, we're going to look at some principles of ecology. So we'll start out with the definition of what is ecology. Ecology is the scientific study of interactions between organisms and their environment. So we've had quite a few conversations up to this point um, that has allowed us to consider this interdependent relationship between organisms and their environment. When we consider the fact that we are heterotrophic organisms, we certainly rely on our environment in order to sustain life. We must consume food in order to obtain energy. So let us explore this idea of how organisms interact with other organisms and their environment, okay? When we consider how organisms interact with their environment, we wanna use the terms biotic and abiotic factors that we must consider, all right? Biotic factors are those that are living factors that are gonna influence an ecosystem, okay? While abiotic factors are the non-living factors that also influence an ecosystem. So biotic components are going to be things like organisms, plants, animals, and so forth. While, while examples of abiotic factors are the sun, the atmosphere, rain, and so forth. These are all factors that influences um, organisms and their environment. So we can look at ecology. We can study the interactions of organisms with other organisms and organisms with their environments from an ecological standpoint. And so we've highlighted the ecological levels of organization where we have the individual, the population, community, ecosystems, and the biosphere. We're gonna take a look today at each level of these, uh, each of these levels of biological organization. At the individual level, we're studying the individual organism, okay? At the population level, we're looking at interactions between organisms of the same species in the same area that's going to make up this population, okay? We can then study communities, all right, where we have several different populations living in the same area, okay? Ecosystems are going to be uh, the community or many different populations or species living together in the same area, plus the uh, non-living factors or abiotic factors. So at the ecosystem level, this is the first level for which we're taking into account both the biotic and abiotic factors, all right? And then we have the biosphere, which is the total sum of all of the ecosystems on earth. We can further divide our biosphere into biomes, and we'll talk about that in our next lesson. So as we consider uh, the interactions amongst, again, organisms and their environment, we need to distinguish between uh, producers and consumers, all right? For producers, sunlight is going to be the main source for energy, right? So we know that plants, for example, are producers, all right? We also refer to these organisms as autotrophs, right? They're going to use sunlight in order to create their own foods. Plants use the process of photosynthesis in order to do this, all right? So we have plants, we have some plant-like protists that are also photosynthetic, and then we have um, bacteria that are also uh, photosynthetic, like our uh, cyanobacteria, okay? Not all, but the cyanobacteria are examples of bacteria that are also photosynthetic. So these are producers, and we're gonna see here that producers are what's going to be sustaining life, right? We're gonna look at this flow of energy as we consider our interactions with our environment and this interdependent relationships, all right? When we look at the food chain, when we look at the food web, we're going to see that this flow of energy, looking at our energy pyramid, we're gonna see this one-way directional flow of energy starting with the sun down to producers, and over to consumers. So we're clear that photosynthesis is a necessary process for producers in order to create their own food. So they capture sunlight energy and convert it to, uh, they convert uh, the reactants, uh, carbon dioxide and water 
into oxygen and carbohydrates, all right? Glucose being one of the carbohydrates that we use as our preferred energy source, right? So our reactants for this process is that we need carbon dioxide, water, and sunlight energy in order to produce oxygen and glucose. This process takes place during photosynthesis, all right? Then we have chemosynthesis that are also perform performed by uh, bacteria that are going to use chemical energy in order to produce uh, carbohydrates, all right? So, so we have organisms that are producers, and then we have those that are consumers, all right? Consumers, by definition, are going to be those organisms that rely on other organisms for energy and food supply, all right? We also refer to these as heterotrophs, all right? So you should be able to distinguish right away, right away between um, an autotroph or a producer and a consumer or a heterotroph, okay? Consumers, there are different types of consumers uh, that exist depending on the foods that they prefer to consume. We know that herbivores are those organisms that obtain energy by eating plants, okay? Carnivores are gonna be our meat eaters, all right? And then we have our omnivores, which are those that eat both plants and animals, all right? And then we have those organisms that are decomposers and they are able to uh, break down dead and organic dead organic matter. All right. So there are different types of consumers that you should be familiar with. And again, we'll see this when we look at our energy pyramid. We're going to see how energy is transferred from one trophic level to the next. And what we'll see is that each uh, level of consumerism becomes a source of food for the trophic level below it, all right? So we'll look at that when we identify our primary, secondary, tertiary, uh, and, and quaternary consumers, all right? So if we want to look at the ecology of communities, right, where we have different populations together, we can refer to these communities as being either opened or closed communities. And then we can also look at the structure of these communities in terms of the uh, food chain and the food web and look at these uh, trophic pyramids that we create here. And so when we're thinking about this uh, conversation about this flow of energy and looking at interactions between organisms and their environment, we must first consider energy flow. Okay, these feeding interactions are going to dictate the amount of energy that these organisms uh, contain. Energy flows through an ecosystem in a one-way direction. So this is a one-way directional flow of energy with the sun being the major source of energy for life on earth. Make sure you jot that down, right? And then that energy is transferred down to producers and over to consumers. This is a one-way directional flow of energy, right? And what we'll see when we look at our energy pyramids is that there's going to be a loss of energy during this energy flow or transfer, okay? So we can look at the food chain, right? Which will define as a series of steps in which organisms transfer energy by eating or being eaten, all right? The food chain is a series of steps in which organisms transfer energy by eating or being eaten, okay? So we're looking at how organisms become a source of food for organisms in the trophic level below them. Okay, as I said before, arrows go in the direction of how energy is being transferred, all right? And we're understanding that this is not the most efficient um, manner for energy transfer. So there is a loss of energy that happens during this transfer, okay? So we start with producers and we end with top consumers or these carnivores, all right? So for example, these uh, the first level of uh, the energy pyramid or food chain is going to be these grass, which are producers, all right? This grass is going to become a source of food for the cricket, all right? So this cricket will consume grass in order to obtain energy. So these arrows indicate that there is a transfer of energy from these plants over to this cricket, all right? And then we have the cricket being consumed by the frog, okay? In order for this frog to obtain energy, it must eat the cricket. Again, energy is being transferred in this manner. 
And then lastly, we have our raccoons at the top of this uh, food chain here that is going to eat the frog. Again, one way directional flow of energy, okay? The highest level of energy is going to be at the level of the producer, okay? As this energy is transferred from one trophic level to the next, there's going to be a loss of energy, okay? So we can construct a food web, right? Which basically displays a network of food chains that exist within an ecosystem, all right? So we can identify the producers and consumers within this food web, all right? Again, our arrows are indicating our directional flow of energy. In this case, our producers are grass. Okay. So I mentioned the term trophic levels, right? When we show the uh, directional flow of energy through ecosystems, we can represent it in a pyramid with different uh, trophic levels, okay? Or each step within this food chain or food web is referred to as a trophic level, okay? Level one, right? At the bottom of this pyramid would be our producers, all right, these are autotrophic organisms that are going to use sunlight energy in order to make food for themselves. All right, so producers are down at the bottom. This is going to be our highest level of energy starting out. All right, then we have our primary consumers. All right, these are going to be our herbivores. All right, primary consumers. Then we have our secondary consumers. These are going to be our carnivores and omnivores. Okay, secondary consumers. All right. These secondary consumers will eat primary consumers. Primary consumers will eat producers, all right? The fourth uh, level of consumer, uh, the fourth level, fourth trophic level are uh, tertiary consumers, all right? Tertiary consumers are typically um, gonna be carnivores um, at the top, our top carnivores in this tertiary uh, consumer level. All right. So these are our trophic levels. And again, we're understanding here that there's energy transfer from one trophic level to the next. Okay. And each trophic level becomes a source of food for the trophic level below it. All right. And so again, I know these things we don't like um, higher order organisms like snakes and so forth that are quite scary, but all of these organisms play a very essential role in the ecosystem, okay? Uh, this ecosystem can be disrupted when there are changes in the uh, dynamics of each of these uh, different types of ecosystems that exist and the organisms that are present and available in this food chain or the food web. So we have to consider these things, all right, as we interact with our with organisms around us and our environment. So we can then consider ecology from the standpoint of ecosystems, all right? As I said before, ecosystems is the level at which we're now able to take into account not only biotic factors, right, but also abiotic factors. So now we're taking into account both the living and non-living factors within this area, within this ecosystem, all right? So we look, we'll look at this energy flow pyramid. We'll look at this idea of nutrient cycling, all right? There are many different cycles that take place in order to sustain and maintain ecosystems okay so we have nutrient cycling where we have these uh cyclic uh biogeochemical cycles all right and then we also have energy flow right so we've talked about this one way directional flow of energy from the sun down to producers and over to consumers so Ecological pyramids, I mentioned them earlier, they are diagrams that we use to show the relative amount of energy uh, um, that organisms contain within each of the trophic levels on, on the food chain or in a food web, all right? So these ecological pyramids are quite helpful for us, all right? So we've got our producers down here at the bottom of this food chain. We've got primary consumers, secondary consumers, 
and tertiary consumers, all right? And we're seeing here that the most amount of energy is gonna be contained here at the primary, I'm sorry, at the producer level, all right? And then there is a transfer of energy that also includes a loss, okay? This I mentioned earlier is that this energy transfer is not the most efficient. There's only a 10% transfer of energy from one trophic level to the next. Make sure you write that down. So the energy pyramid, again, is quite useful for us to demonstrate uh, the relative amounts of energy that are available at each trophic level, okay? So organisms in trophic level one use the available energy for life's processes, right? So photosynthesis, respiration, and so forth. And then again, we're understanding that there's going to be some release or loss of energy as heat. Um, yes, and so we're understanding, we're clear that our bodies are constantly undergoing uh, metabolic processes, chemical pro processes that are going to utilize and uh, release heat. This is what happens during respiration. Okay, so there's a rule of 10. So we're saying that there's only about a 10% transfer of energy from one trophic level to the next. Okay, so jot that down not a very efficient process, all right? And so then we can also construct a biomass pyramid that represents the amount of living matter at each uh, trophic level here, all right? So here we have an energy pyramid where we can have a relative uh, distribution or amount of energy that is represented from one trophic level to the next, okay? Where our biomass pyramid shows us the live the makeup of the living organisms at each trophic level. Okay? So together these energy and biomass pyramids represent represents amounts of energy available at each level as well as the amount of living organisms or tissue um, that both decrease with increasing trophic levels, okay? So the biomass is going to decrease as the trophic level increases. So I mentioned uh, biogeochemical cycles earlier. These are definitely um, factors that we have to take into account as we examine ecosystems, okay? So we've got hydrolytic cycles, uh, phosphorus cycle, nitrogen cycle, carbon cycles. There's a number of different biogeochemical cycles that are essential for maintaining balance amongst ecosystems. So if we looked at interactions amongst species, organisms, okay? There are interactions such as a competition, predation, symbiosis. Let's take a look at some of these interactions. We often can describe the types of species specific interactions as either being mutualist, excuse me, mutualistic, right? A mutualistic interaction is one where both parties benefit from this relationship, okay? A mutualistic benefit, a mutualistic, mutualistic relationship, excuse me, um, is one in which both parties benefit, okay? Commensalism is a type of interaction or relationship where one party benefits from the uh, relationship and the other party neither is benefit, neither uh, is harmed or uh, receives any benefit. So this is sort of a commensal relationship. One party is benefiting and the other party is um, just neutral, okay? Um, then we have parasitism. Parasitism is a relationship in which one organism or one party benefits and the other one is uh, harmed, but not usually killed, all right? And if you think about this in, in context, we understand that this is a situation where this uh, parasitic organism that stands to benefit, okay, from the host, uh, it is advantageous to not kill that host, right? But that that uh, parasitic organism can uh, render harm to uh, the host, okay, that is harboring uh, the parasite. And then we have uh, predation. Predation is a relationship where one organism benefits and the other is usually killed. All right. So I think it would be important that you are able to distinguish between these types of uh, species or interactions amongst uh, organisms. Okay. 
mutualistic relationships or interactions, commensalism, parasitism, and predation. Other ecological uh, interactions that we just talked about here, we have competition. When two organisms of the same or different species attempt to utilize or inhabit the same ecological resources at the same time, that's where we get some competition, okay? We see this in the wild. We see this in many different aspects of different ecosystems. There is competition. Example, we're competing for organisms can't compete for food, for water, for shelter, all of these uh, factors that are going to be important for sustaining life, maintaining this homeostatic balance, okay? So when two organisms of the same or different species attempt to use um, the same ecological resources at the same time in the same place, it's going to lead to competition, okay? So for example, monkeys compete with each other and other animals for food in the same general area, all right? Um, rams compete with each other for when it's time for mating, okay? All right, so then we can consider this idea of an ecological niche. The ecological niche involves both a place where organisms live and the role of the organism in this habitat, okay? So for example, the ecological niche of a sunflower growing in the backyard includes absorbing light, water, and nutrients necessary for photosynthesis. And then it also provides shelter and food for other organisms such as beetles, ants, and so forth. And these plants can give off oxygen into the atmosphere. So if we consider if we consider the ecological niche here, we're taking into account the place where this organism is existing and the roles for which these organisms take on in this habitat. So the ecological niche of this sunflower is that, again, it is growing in the backyard, it's absorbing light, water, nutrients, all of the necessary components for photosynthesis, it's providing shelter and food for other organisms, and it's also giving off oxygen into the atmosphere. Okay. Um, predation. Predation is another relationship that we must take into account as we look at ecosystems. There are different ecosystems, different organisms that may um, be a, a, a part of this a predation. Okay, We talked about predation as a relationship in which one organism captures and feeds on another organism. In this case, one member is going to be harmed. Okay, The predation relationship involves both a predator and prey, all right? The predator is the one that does the killing while the prey is the one that becomes a source of food. The last relationship is one of symbiosis, okay? A symbiotic relationship is any relationship in which two species live closely together, all right? So we see this in terms of a mutualistic uh, relationship or existence, mutualistic interactions where both parties uh, benefit from this interaction. So this is what we would consider 
a win-win situation, okay? Examples of a um, mutualistic interaction would be um, flowers and insects. When we think about the process of pollination, this is absolutely a uh, mutualistic interaction, okay? Can you think of any other examples? And then we have commensalism, right? Commensalism is a relationship or interaction between organisms where one member benefits and the other is neither harmed nor helped, all right? An example of commensalism in this case is when the remora fish attaches to the shark and gets a free ride, right? This fish gets its nice ride, the shark is unharmed, all right? Birds building the nest on the tree, they get their nice place to uh, protect and lay eggs, the tree is unharmed, all right? And then parasitism, all right? Parasitism is an interaction or relationship where one organism lives on or in another organism and causes harm to it, okay? The parasite obtains all or part of its nutritional requirements from the host. And in turn, this host is going to be negatively impacted by this interaction. An example of a parasitic relationship is the fleas on a dog, all right? So wasps laying eggs on the back of the caterpillar, this is most certainly um, a parasitic relationship, okay? Sea lampreys feeding on the fluids of other fish, all right? Mosquitoes biting a human. This can definitely be a potentially harmful situation, especially if this mosquito is harboring parasites, all right? We'll stop here and we'll pick up with the ecology of the biosphere on next class.